welcome everybody to the final day of our Koopman's lecture series about psychosocial oncology research and practice with Indigenous communities, unique issues and key considerations. We've had a couple of great sessions already and some really good discussion. I'm very much looking forward to continuing that today with our final uh, keynote speaker and panel. Let me just begin with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that what we call Alberta is the traditional and ancestral territory of many peoples presently subject to Treaty 6, 7, and 8, namely the Blackfoot Confederacy, Kainai, Pekani, and Siksika, the Cree, Dene, Salto, Nakota Sioux, Stony Nakota, and the Suksina Nation, and the Métis people of Alberta. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. We make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. Now, just again, a little bit of background of the Koopmans lectureship. Uh, a couple of days ago, we had Jan Koopmans give us a you know, sort of lively uh, background about uh, uh, Catherine Horikos Koopmans. So the speaker, the speaker series is supported by the Catherine Horikos Koopmans lectureship. And this endowment was established to honor the memory of Kathy Porikos Koopmans. Uh, she was a researcher uh, and had an interest in the area of psychosocial oncology. Sadly, she died at a fairly young age from breast cancer. So her late husband, or I guess her husband, um, and her mother put together this endowment so that we could support uh, distinguished visiting speakers presenting a lecture on psychosocial oncology every couple of years. And so I managed that through the division of psychosocial oncology at the School of Medicine. We're very pleased today to have the culminating lecture of the uh, 2021 lecture series. So we're going to start with Barry Baltz from the Planning Committee, who will introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Nadine Karan. Following that, we'll have a panel discussion, which will be uh, moderated by Arrow Big Smoke. And these are the uh, participants in the panel discussion, whom Barry will also introduce. And then we'll finish with audience Q&A. I want to just acknowledge the planning committee who's worked very hard to pull this all together over the last few months. Uh, so big thank yous go to Angeline Latender, Arrow Big Smoke, Barry Baltz, Deborah Allett, Daniel Petricone, Westwood. I'd also like to echo that uh, fabulous talk that you gave uh, Nadine. Um, I remember first hearing you in Vancouver, I think in 2017, and knew that you were absolutely the right person to be here today. So. Uh, as I said, it was a privilege and great honor to introduce you. I'm going to take a few seconds and just talk about the panel. Uh, the, the panel discussion is going to be led by our very own Arrow Big Smoke, who's a colleague of many of us. Uh, she will be moderating today's uh, panel discussion. She's an Indigenous cancer patient navigator, supporting Indigenous Albertas impacted by cancer. Uh, she's recently joined the Tom Baker uh, as an advocate and works very closely within the psychosocial oncology department. Uh, next will be Angeline Latender, who's a scientist with Alberta Health Services, Alberta Cancer Prevention Legacy Fund, working to co-lead Indigenous community projects with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis populations in Alberta. Uh, then there is Leah Bill, who presented yesterday. She's the executive director of the Alberta First Nations Information Governance Center. Leah is a traditional practitioner that applies an integrated approach to the practice combining Indigenous knowledge with nursing knowledge. Lisa has worked as a frontline nurse in the First Nations communities for over 30 years. And the final member of the panel, along with you, Dr. Caron, is Rita Henderson, who's an assistant professor in the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. Rita is a co-lead of the Medical School's Truth and Reconciliation Commission response titled Indigenous Health Dialogue. Her research focuses on the population health and equities systems, change and the critical health professional education. And now I'll turn it over to Arrow and the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Caron, for that uh, really, um, I think, needed presentation. Um, 
it's something um, equity versus equality is definitely something that um, we're passionate about and and oftentimes explaining the purpose behind it and why you do things for certain patients and why you you know, don't do it for everybody is something that we often um, will have to ha find ourselves having to explain. And so um, one of the my, one of the questions that that I was thinking of as you were speaking to this um, is um, when just given the hierarchical um, uh, structure that the health system is. Um, surgeons are, are ranked at, at the top. Um, and so to hear you come down and again talk on or speak to um, Leah's, Leah's conception yesterday around relationship building and being um, a facilitator um, in, in that role to help your clients. Um, if, you, if you wouldn't mind just maybe elaborating a little bit about how that framework works for you and your clients, and then maybe discussing a little bit about how you're able to articulate why we're needing to have that equity versus equality picture for the rest of the colleagues here on the line. Thank you, Errol. Um... I think first of all, you know, sort of starting off with the perception that there's this hierarchy and that surgeons are, you know, at, at one level of it. Um, I think one of the things I've, I've tried to do my whole career is get rid of the hierarchy um, and, and essentially uh, sort of recognize that if I'm in the operating room and I need an instrument, um, if the nurse doesn't get it for me, I can't operate. Um, if the if the person who is cleaning the operating room doesn't do it safely, my patient will die, and it doesn't matter how good of a surgeon I am because the risk of infections will be astronomical. Um, if it's the person who's booking the patient and how they interact with Lisa or Bonnie or you know and and how they make that conversation on the phone saying hi, you know my name is Arrow. I'm calling from the University Hospital of Northern British Columbia because you have a surgery booked with Dr. Carone. Do you have any questions versus uh, like a top-down approach where the individual feels that they are being listened to and they're being heard and being respected? I think it's so important to, to get rid of that hierarchy. Um, the other thing, you know, as a personal goal, uh, I always wanted, I wanted people to be shocked if they found out I was a surgeon. Um, I, I wanted, and, and it seems like an odd, uh, an odd goal, but um, because of, you know, there's the, the perception of hierarchy, but there's also the, the perception of, of, um, of how a surgeons generally as a profession we are compared to, for example, social workers um, or counselors. Or, you know, people who have a skill set that is obviously, if we were to use that hierarchy, they're at the top and surgeons are way at the bottom. <laughs> and, and, and so I think one of the things is to have the courage to step out of the hierarchy and decide where you want to fit uh, in all of it. Um, and then, and when speaking about uh, sort of that element that uh, that Leah uh, Bill has uh, has talked about. I, you know, I've had the honor of working with Leah, and that's through Angeline uh, Latondra, who has uh, who first introduced me to Leah, and just the the wisdom that you that you get um, when just sitting back and listening uh, from people who really have that space. So when it comes to the hierarchy, in my mind, you know, at many meetings that I've been at, Leah is at the top. And I'm just like, I'm one of those little minions want, hoping that I can learn something from Leah and, and her perspectives and, and her experience. And so I think part of it is recognizing um, how important it is. And then to, if you believe in it, um, to then step out and be able to, to advocate for it. And so it's interesting. I said that I was humbled uh, and a bit intimidated to do this talk today. Um, and in the end, in a way, the audience today, I'm much more comfortable speaking in front of than surgeons, who I think are have a long way to come. I think they would be perplexed by some of the things I said today. Whereas I do believe that just based on the fact that the, the audience has joined us today, 
I'm anticipating that I have much to learn from them and that many of the things I was saying, they were nodding their heads as they were the people in the trenches helping many of the people like like the, the Bonnies and the Lisas and that, uh, that Barry gave me names for. So, um, and, and thank you very much as well um, for helping all of those clients the way that you did and going above and beyond um, what, uh, you know, I, what I've seen as a, as a nurse working in the healthcare system um, for over a decade now, have seen physicians um, um, that you taking that extra step in calling the police um, and making sure that client was safely at home. Um, and I think too, you having that knowledge as a, as a, as a First Nations person um, and, and being able to uh, work through maybe some of the barriers from those more remote communities, such as transportation and, and having a phone line that many of us would take for granted. Um, so thank you for bringing those um, some of those, those barriers forward to the providers on the call um, to think through maybe the next time that they have a client who maybe isn't showing up for an appointment, that there's more to it. Um, so um, I'd also like to just say as well, for anybody else on the line that wants to come off the mute, mute um, and would like to ask their questions as well, that that is also welcome. Um, and uh, so just moving on cut to um, another topic that um, I had noticed as well that you had said was um, when we talk about, again, that hierarchy and, and, and you had mentioned putting Leah at the top there, that is definitely something that, um, so Dr. Patriconi Westwood and I have been working well together and, um, and closely. And one of the things that, one of the first teachings that she had shared with me was, she said, she came in and said, oh, well, you know, I called this, I called this client and they're not, they're not answering so you know I'll just I'll just leave it and I was like well in actuality you know with our elders we call them you know it's not the expectation that they call us so it's kind of again going back to that that importance of in our in our indigenous culture and protocol around you know allowing an elder to, to share what they're saying finish what they're saying taking in what they're saying um and then also having that protocol of like there are there are leaders and they're the ones that we work with right so um so and and I, I guess another thing as well that um, I had picked out through your your presentation that it also transcended through the other presentations that had come through was um, again sorry Leah I'm picking on you but um, when we're talking about she had mentioned um, creating an environment that it, where our clients are able to connect to spirit and nature um, in that natural way. And so being a surgeon and, and being in a very sterile clinical environment, how, how are some ways that you are able to bring that to your client? You, you know what, I, um, it's a great question. And so it's challenging for me to bring that to, uh, to my clients. But I think one of the things that you can do is honor it and, and respect it. Um, and so asking your client in a way to almost bring it to you. Um, some of the, one of the greatest things in the world is to feel uh, respected and to feel needed. And for me to learn from my patients, my clients, for them to share that element of things um, and for me to, to demonstrate my interest in it um, is I think one way that I, that I do it when they're coming from that space, especially elders uh, and knowledge keepers that are coming in uh, to the space and whether it's because they are the individual that's been referred to me or they're accompanying a loved one or a community member uh, and being able to have that dialogue. So it, it's interesting that some of my conversations uh, can really, you know, if there was a, you know, someone listening in, uh, much of my discussions uh, will divert uh, and not uh, be so much about the medical, uh, but about the other elements of it that are just as critical to understanding where patients are from. Um, 
So, I, and, then, and then just to kind of just top up on that as well, something that I have seen as well, and I've been very fortunate enough to be a part of, is for um, clients that are going for surgery um, that have actually asked to have their body parts returned to them for ceremony. Is that something that you've seen and that you've been able to, to help out with? Um, you know what, it's interesting. It, I haven't seen it much. Um, but I have uh, been involved in conversations about it and we, we have facilitated it. Um, and I think where I've been brought into that dialogue early on in my career in particular was in the area of obstetrics, which I don't do. Um, but a classic example is the request for the placenta um, by some of the communities. Uh, and so I have been involved more as an advocate, not as an expert, not in a, as an expert in their culture, nor as an expert in that field of medicine, but as someone that can understand that request and, and advocate on behalf of the, the, request, the individuals and the families for that request to be honored. And in my experience, it has been. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, Hazel, uh, it looks like you have a question. Um, I have a question and a comment. I'm. Um... My name is Hazel McKenna, and I'm a three-time survivor of breast cancer. And also I have a, a little, we have an organization in Edmonton called the Wakotuin Society, which is a group of indigenous women who came together and formed a group so that we could help all other um, cancer patients. And we've done that since 1997, when we sort of incorporated and every year we've had a retreat where we discuss how we can better help our communities of women that have cancer. And we've visited people in the hospital, we've accompanied them, and we've done all this on our own, on our own initiative. We have tried many times to get funding to do some other stuff, but that's okay. We can manage on our own, on, with other help, help from the community. And we have done retreats every year. And every year we have all female physicians and female nurses, female physiotherapists, female elders, pipe holders, uh, sweat keepers. We do all the gamut. And we have strongly recommended to our women that they go the traditional way also in 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 time with the with western medicine that's what i did i've gone through three surgeries one in 1997 203 and just a 2020 in november november 20 november the 8th i went to have a mammogram yearly mammogram and the excellent eye of the radiologist said to me, I don't like the look on this little, little thing. So the next day I had another, I had an ultrasound. The next day I had a biopsy and I saw the surgeon a week after and my surgery was in between a hospital closing and uh, the surgeon um, the surgeon giving me time and said, okay, come in, you know, we'll, we'll arrange it. And we did. And I've been doing well so far uh, with uh, aftercare. Listerstall is what I'm taking for five years, but I also have my sweat lodge and my medicine. So uh, all, we encourage all our women to do that. And it's grassroots. So in the but there's so many things that we could do. <laughs> like one family has five of the sisters have breast cancer from a certain area in Alberta, from Sturgeon Lake. And, you know, we've had Prince George you're talking about. We've had to put a lady from Prince George on the bus after surgery. And we put a pillow under her arm wrapped her in a blanket and put her on the Greyhound bus at midnight to get to, back to Prince George. And we knew she was on her own looking after grandchildren. And that's as far as we could go at that time. 
and here there was, you know, there's so many stories that we could tell of what happened, but our women that, that we have, that we're evolving, have been able to speak for their own health and have asked questions. And if they didn't like the doctor, they saw another one. And it, it really is empowering when it's our own grassroots, grassroots um, organization. And we have lots of fun when we have our retreat. We have like the group of 40 women. That's, that's all we can accommodate because we go to Poundmaker Lodge. And I know Angelique, when she was nursing, came to our, to our events. So she knows about us. <laughs> Angelique does. And, you know, we have fun time. We have crying time. We have medical time. And we've all said, you know, we are as important. And 90 percent of us are residential school survivors or affected by a residential school. The first ones we see now are the next ones we're seeing now are mothers or, or daughters of residential school survivors. And we have changed that that it's wrong because we've been we were taught in residential school that our customs were pagan. We weren't supposed to be speaking our language but I've kept my language and I'm still fluent. Unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't teach my children the language as much, but they certainly know the customs. But I remember always my father saying when we said, well, we can't say this in, 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 in we call it Indian then. And they said, we said, my girl, Think in your language. Nobody can tell you what to think and translate for yourself and you'll always know your, your language. And my father lived to the ripe old age of 100 and my mother was 84. After that, I don't know. I'm 73 years old now. And I, I know that there was so, no cancer in my family as far as I know. But I don't know that because there was no history taken. There's no history that I can go back to. I didn't know what their history is. So, but we were bought, brought up in two worlds. My father was a very traditional elder and we attended the ceremonies. My mother is a different story. Again, I don't know her she was born close to the reserve to um, a Métis mother and a an, an non-Indigenous father, an Englishman. But mom died, her mother died at birth. So she was given to the Native people to raise because they were the closest. So my mother was nursed by Indigenous women. She became treaty. She went to residential school, totally a white person. That's where I come from. So I said, I always was born with a shoe and a, and a moccasin. And to end my story, my brothers used to say, we're gonna be saved. My mother puts holy water all over the place. My father puts tobacco down. That's my history. And I, I married, I married to the same man for 51 years in two days. <laughs> in two days. <laughs> and I always say I'm very racist because I call him my white man. So, <laughs> and so, and so much stuff had happened when, you know, I was, I was born treaty, I was born, but when I married him, I lost my treaty rights. And I have a card that says you are no longer an Indian according to the Indian Act. But on the other hand, I have two sister-in-laws that are treaty Indians and their children are treaty. But that came back, but you know, and I have a little grandson now who's treaty. <laughs> so it's because we, we came back but it's, it's, you know, women, we've learned that too now in our history, women in our communities were the leaders and they're going to be again because that's when everything is going to change. I also just, I have to go now because otherwise I'll speak all day. I go to the University of Alberta and we do teachings. And there, People don't even know that residential school survivors are alive. They thought that was, they think that was a long time ago because nobody knew about it. Nobody spoke about it. 
that was a hidden thing. And it still is. It's, you know, well, it happened a long time ago. Get over it is what we get. So we get over it, I suppose. But no, you can't get over that kind of trauma. Physical, mental, emotional trauma that we all went through. Because you, you don't, you hide your body. You even, you don't talk about it because it was a sin at my age. So that's one of some of the things that our indigenous women face. The Catholic system says you can't, you, you can't use your indigenousness. It's your indigenous medicine. You can't use that. But that's so important for us to go back to the earth. And the last story is one of the women said, she went to the doctor and they said, we're going to, this, we're going to take it out. And she said, no, I'm going to decide that. So she said she went to the bush and she screamed and she said, what am I going to take? Mastectomy, lumpectomy, mastectomy, lumpectomy. She said, tell me. So she went back home and her little grandson, who was three years old, and says, Coco, you have to have a lumpectomy. And she said, OK, they told me. And that's what she did. And she's fine today. <laughs> anyway, miigwech. Thank you, Hazel, for sharing your story and a bit about yourself and the work that you're currently doing. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, I'd like to open it up to the panel um, for anybody that has any comments for Hazel. I'll, I'll make some comments. Can I ask him to stay Hazel? Stay with the Nisoni or Emiya, Iwaminaya. You could actually pick the man you go, Mamma Mopic Squawk. Mamma Scott, a more more point in stone, Nagaki of all. So I was just talking to Hazel and saying, you know, I'm really grateful for her sharing, but uh, it's the first time I've actually heard of the society. So, um, and really would like to open the door to connect with her and really try to support and help because uh, obviously you know, they've tried to get additional funding. And really, uh, from my perspective, these are the kinds of things that we support really um, try to expand because they're the ones that are really making the difference. Um, Would be support, yeah. Yeah. You're I'm, I'm hearing good. little bits of you, I can't. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we can uh, be in touch after. So yeah. Um, okay. There's no, me glitch that way. Probably, yeah. So I, I want to I'm, talk you're breaking up on me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry about <laughs> I that. I have to move around my house so I can get the Wi-Fi properly. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, I think Nadine has very eloquently uh, demonstrated to us uh, in her presentation uh, roles and positioning and uh, and I think that that's really what's key. And, and when we look at it from uh, a healer, uh, knowledge keeper, or an indigenous person uh, perspective, um, it's not about hierarchy, but it's the role that you have been designated or even born into. So there is no hierarchy. It's about sitting in in that role that you were designated to be and all of the resources that are around you that are helping to uh, enhance your role and to support you in delivering whatever the service or the gifts that you have. And that's the big difference between the healthcare system and even the professionals, like I said yesterday, it's unfortunate that we call ourselves professionals we're, we're actually service providers. We're in service to humanity, specifically if you um, uh, look at health, uh, all the whole realms of health. And if you go back to the original uh, uh, Socrates' uh, philosophy as to the reason why you enter into, and it's to do no harm and to be in service. Now, what happened over the uh, decades that that's changed to become a focus of uh, it's about 
uh, how much money am I getting paid? Am I going to become a doctor so that I can make this amount of money? Or am I going to become a, a psychiatrist? Or am I going to become a phys? That's, that's what's highlighted. It's not about uh, the service that's being provided and how it's actually going to change or influence the health and well being and the collective of human beings as a whole. So when you have these two dichotomies of uh, what we call indigenous health systems, because it's not just First Nations, it's all around the world. There are some very common threads that weave us together uh, that are similar. And the first and foremost is you are in service and it's about being humble. And that you, you're only the, the facilitator and the conduit to all, because there's something out there that's far greater and far more wiser and has the capacity to actually direct us and guide us, but we don't listen. And I love the story about the little grandchild because children are considered to be the most pure conduits of wisdom to us. And I'm really happy the grandmother listened to her grandson because a non-Indigenous person would say, what the heck, this kid knows nothing why would I listen to a kid tell me to go get a lumpectomy? Um, so it's, it's, it's wonderful. And I think we have to try to change that. And I don't know, uh, having now been a nurse, um, I've been a traditional healer ever since I was a child because I helped my, my grandmother. She was a midwife and I was at her side when she was delivering babies. So I saw things and and was part of things right from the time I was quite little. And that's not customary among non-Indigenous people because we are all of a sudden in this protective mode or the general societies, you have to protect your kids and uh, from even witnessing the birth of a child, which is life. You know, we, it's in a sterile environment or you take them off to the hospital, the siblings don't even get a chance to see this uh, in most instances, to see their uh, brother or sister come into the world. So we've got a long ways to go yet, <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to make those comments. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Leah. I think that your, um that your, your reference to our resources that help us to facilitate this work. Um, one thing that I have definitely um, have been very grateful for is the allies that I've found within this work that are you know, the, the providers that help to put this, this, this conference on, seeing the importance of bringing some of these, um, not just barriers and challenges, but also our strengths as, pe as, as, as First Nations people to the attention of healthcare providers that are working with our, with our clients day in and day out. Um, and so what is some, um, I guess I can open this up to the panel, but what are some ways that we could maybe work to collaboratively together to develop and spread the word of allyship and this, um, this ideal of, of relationship and um, respect and, and, and being able to promote um, our Indigenous cultures? I saw Angeline raised her hand. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, there you are. I'm looking yeah, at my this, screen. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's such a big question. It's something that uh, I know in our work, me and Leah and others ponder this question a lot. Uh, you know, one of the, na the national projects we're involved in, one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to understand better and articulate more concretely the role and the work of Indigenous healthcare providers within the cancer system. And one of the things that's a big project funded through the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, one of the reasons I think they decided to to fund it because we took the idea to them was because we wanted to better understand how each of these roles 
uh, see themselves addressing many of the questions that Nadine brought up. And one of those in particular, as well as the nurses and physicians, is social workers. Um, I think uh, having worked with social workers in cancer control and uh, now in cancer prevention and screening, I certainly gained as an Indigenous person and in history uh, with social workers, I gained a newfound respect uh, for the work that they do. And I think it's very um, misunderstood social workers and, and, and their training and the work that they do is much more than about giving people taxi chits and finding them shoes to wear and giving them meal money for meal. Um, and we don't know that much about it. And they work really, really hard within the cancer care system. And how do we support them? And how do we work with them as a team and as, as, as members that are put there to do the specific roles that Leah and Nadine have both referred to. And so trying to better understand that and they and you know, they're not care professionals. They're, they're, they, I think they often get uh, viewed in that way. They're, they're very well trained. And so what do they bring um, as indigenous people and they're from their own experiences and lives that they that we can actually be starting to utilize in a much more effective way to provide services along um, with everybody else on the team. And I think that's particularly important for the psychosocial care. And if I can take away one uh, theme, overarching theme from this whole uh, series, you know, it's the significance of addressing um, emotional, mental, and spiritual needs of families and patients that has the biggest difference, makes the biggest difference in them achieving optimal wellness, no matter what they're experiencing. Thanks very much for that opportunity to speak. Thank you, Angeline. Was there anybody else that wanted to jump in on Angeline's comment? I could I could say something. This is Rita. Um, I think uh, as I mean I, I try not to think of myself so much as an ally as a as an accomplice um, because <clears throat> I follow the lead of the people the indigenous people that I work with. Um, they did. They they really bring to me the ideas and the vision that they have to to put forward and the priorities. And I try to work within that. Um, so um, I, I I think just as a non-indigenous person working in this area, it's always fraught with like the question of do I belong here? Is this the appropriate? And I always tend to come to the um, the sense that um, it's that there is a lot about the systems, the healthcare systems that exist, um, that we're working in, that is not the problem of Indigenous people to fix alone. And it would be unfair to leave that to the search for answers to, to people who may want to dedicate their time more appropriately to um, working in, in, in their traditional medicines and, and, and contributing to the knowledge base in, the, in those ways. And so um, so I'd say that I have two sort of guiding principles there. One is to see myself as an accomplished, accomplished meaning I'm positioned um, to, to like fight the good fight with the people that um, are most affected by it and that, that are determining the, the direction and to dedicate my energies to the systems that would be really unfair for, to leave to Indigenous people to to like spend a lot of their time focusing on. Can I just quickly ask a follow-up? Like what specifically, Rita, what systems do you see yourself well positioned, you know, to sort of tweak? Maybe you're even gonna ask that, Errol, <laughs> sorry. Well, in, um, in the medical school, for instance, nobody picked up, a, you know, a, a vision for addressing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission within the first year of it coming out. and. 
So we sort of, uh, among a number of us that, that work in Indigenous health sort of looked around and said, well, we don't have a mandate, but the calls to action are, are calling on governments to do these things and we are government funded. And so we're gonna do something. And, um, and that was really coming from Dr. Cheryl Barnaby and Dr. Lindsay Croshu being like, something's gotta be addressed here. And, and so I stood up and we, we like figured out how we could do something. And, and eventually we wrote a report that was mentioned earlier in the introduction and th nobody really asked us to do that. But by the end, um, you know, leadership was sort of speaking about what we were coming out with our Indigenous Health Dialogue and our report and our, our kind of analytical framework is like our strategic plan. And we were like, wow, <laughs> how did that become a strategic plan when it was just us sort of stirring, stirring things up a bit? And so that's one way I think that um, I've, I've learned from Dr. Crochu to always, his vision for leadership, he has a vision for leadership that is always about like, like horizontal relationships and vertical relationships and you're always like nurturing those relationships to be ready for when others are ready to walk a path with you and um and so he he tends to try to just be ready when somebody comes forward and and wants to explore um what they can do and and that being that readiness i think takes takes work and but it requires sitting back enough as well to not be plowing through with answers and and like building big things ambitiously and, and sort of taking the mantle and taking it on yourself when it's truly needs to be driven and envisioned by the people most affected in community. Nadine, I, I saw you pick your hand up a couple of times. Did you, did you want to comment? I, you know, I think the panel has done a great job of, uh, <clears throat> of sharing their perspectives, certainly from um, whether it's academic and research and, and right down in the trenches. Uh, I would agree. Um, one of the things that just was recently said that, and to follow up on what Rita mentioned is I think um, it's really important uh, for organizations, uh, whether government, organizations, institutions, to recognize that as we move forward as a country and we're recognizing these, these these crevices, these faults, these gaps, these disparities, these wrongdoings, whatever the context that is that we're talking about. And I agree, it's it's not for Indigenous peoples, it's not our responsibility to fix them. We, we want to be at the table, we, we want to be part of the solutions. But like, for example, small things actually make a big difference. And so when we're doing research, like there's this one research project that we are working on and it was to address equity. Was if I were to summarize it in one cent, in one word, it would be equity. Um, and one of the things was it was a massive grant with a with a multi million dollar budget, and we were looking for partnerships with indigenous organizations. But we made it very clear that we wanted to move forward on this path with them, but we would not be asking for any leveraging funds from them. Because there was, we were addressing an equity issue that was embedded within the institutions and the and the assimilation policies and the, the everything that sort of led up to this, to the point where it's it's the government's responsibility to you know we'll help them we'll actually do the work we'll go out to the communities we'll work with the communities we'll we'll do the work um, but we're not going to shoulder the cost of this. Yeah, it, it's time that like, you can't keep putting out inquiry reports and, and calls to action and articles in UNDRIP and legislation of the of UNDRIP itself and, and then say, you know, now, you know, we've done our job. I, I completely agree with Rita um, that we're ready to be at the table. We're very capable. We are, you know, we have, we have ideas of what our communities want. We're willing to use our partnerships. Um, but we're not going to pay the price. Um, that time has come and gone. Um, you're you're absolutely right, uh, Nadine. It's it's there's this um, they they put it out there of you know this is what we need to be doing and and from and it sounds like there we have people that are willing to do it, but like you said though, you kind of got to put your put put your money where your mouth is essentially and put and invest in these programs and, and, and create more positions for um, in, Indigenous individuals to be leaders within these organizations. 
Absolutely. Very empowering. I think that that's a fantastic way to um, wrap up the discussion. And so um, I will hand it over to Linda for any closing comments. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Errol, for leading the discussion and the contributions from all the panelists uh, today and over the course of the, the lecture series. It's really just been wonderful um, for many of us who are new to this area to get a better understanding of some of the challenges, the inequities, you know, ways we can partner together. And I think it's really again, just the beginning of an ongoing conversation and some relationship building. So it's been wonderful to hear from everybody and really um, many thanks go also to the planning committee who I mentioned earlier, everyone who's participated over the last three days and especially to our wonderful panel of speakers. So thank you so much for your time and energy towards this and hopefully many good seeds have been planted and we'll um, be able to continue this really important work. So thank you. <laughs>